Flexor anatomy. Which one of the following is true regarding the anatomy of the flexor tendons? The FDP tendons are attached to the lumbricals in the palm. Flexion of the digits is controlled by the FDS, FDP, and FPL muscles. The FDP originates from the proximal ulna and interosseous membrane and inserts into the distal phalanges to provide flexion at the dip joints and contributes to pip joint flexion. It is also attached to the lumbricals in the palm and this is important after flexor tendon division as the proximal end of the FDP tendon will therefore not retract further proximal than the mid-palm. The FDS originates from the medial epicondyle of the humerus and coronoid process of the ulna and inserts into the middle phalanges to provide flexion at the pip joints. The FPL originates at the proximal radius, interosseous membrane, coronoid process, and sometimes from the medial epicondyle of the humerus. It inserts into the distal phalanx of the thumb to provide flexion of the IP joint. Camper's chiasm represents the division of FDS into two slips on either side of the FDP tendon distal to the level of the MP joint. The two slips insert separately to the middle phalanx. Knowledge of the anatomic position of the FDS tendons at the wrist is useful during spaghetti wrist repair as this can help to identify the tendons accurately. The index and little finger FDS tendons lie deep, not superficial to the ring and middle FDS tendons. Which one of the following flexor muscles is entirely supplied by the anterior interosseous nerve? The FPL the anterior interosseous nerve is a branch of the median nerve in the forearm. It supplies the FPL, the pronation quadratus, and the radial 2 FDP tendons. The ulna 2 FDP tendons are supplied by the ulnar nerve and the FDS are supplied by the median nerve directly. When not due to neuritis, anterior interosseous nerve palsy can occur secondary to compression of the nerve by the tendinous edge of the deep head of the pronator teres or tendinous origin of FDS. Patients with this condition cannot flex the index dip joint or thumb IP joint normally, resulting in an abnormal tip pinch grip. Patients cannot make the OK sign in this scenario. There is no sensory deficit present because the anterior interosseous has no cutaneous sensory branches. Pulley system When repairing a digital flexor tendon injury, which combination of pulleys is it most important to preserve? A2 and A4 The pulley system in the digits involves five annular pulleys and three cruciate pulleys. The annular pulleys are located along the flexor sheath starting at the MP joint with A1. The even-numbered annular pulleys are located over the phalangeal shafts, A2 proximal phalanx and the A4 middle phalanx, while the odd-numbered pulleys are located over the small joints, A1 MP, A3 PIP, A5 DIP. 
Their collective function is to prevent bow stringing of the tendon during flexion and provide a mechanical advantage. Ideally they should be preserved during flexor tendon repair. However, the A2 and A4 pulleys are thought to be the most important. Which one of the following represents the major nutritional supply to the flexor tendons within the digits? Synovial diffusion from the flexor sheath. Tendon nutrition in the digits depends significantly on diffusion from the synovial sheath. The other sources of nutrition listed each make a variable contribution to tendon nutrition, but the vascular network within the digital flexor tendons is sparse. The bony insertion and musculotendinous junction blood supply is limited to around 1 cm of tendon length at each site with the remaining blood supply arising from the vinculi. In the forearm and proximal digit there is also a vascular supply from segmental vessels in the paratenin. Axial blood supply within the flexors tends to be located in the dorsal portion of the tendon, so many surgeons prefer to place sutures in the volar portion during repair in the hope of maximizing blood supply. In contrast, there is some evidence that placing the core sutures dorsally within the tendon may be biomechanically advantageous. Principles of Repair what represents the recommended threshold for performing formal repair using a core suture in partially divided flexor tendon injuries? 50% Division The management of partial flexor tendon repairs will depend on a number of factors such as the location, the flexor tendon involved, and the type of injury sustained. It will also be affected by surgeon preference. However, most agree that tendon lacerations involving more than 50% of the tendon diameter should be formally repaired with core and epitendinous sutures. Lesser divisions should be smoothed off or repaired with simple sutures to avoid the edges catching and to ensure the tendon ends are neatly apposed. When repairing a zone 2 digital flexor tendon injury, which one of the following is correct? An epitendinous suture will add approximately 15% to 20% strength to the core suture repair. The main benefit of using an epitendinous suture is that it adds up to 20% additional strength to the repair. In addition, it helps to smooth the repair and improve gliding within the flexor sheath. A meta-analysis of complications after flexor tendon repair also suggested that the rate of reoperation is reduced by 84% if an epitendinous suture is used. There is debate surrounding the optimal positioning of core sutures with volar positioning considered to be best for tendon vascularity and dorsal positioning considered more biomechanically favorable during active flexion. In reality, Many tendons are sufficiently thin that reliably placing the suture anywhere other than centrally is challenging. A minimum four strand, not two, core suture repair is required in order to commence early active mobilization. This may be undertaken as a two strand core suture combined with a two strand mattress, as two separate two strand core sutures, 
or as a single four-strand core suture repair. There is no definitive evidence that a four-strand single knot technique is superior to two adjacent two-strand core sutures. Some surgeons prefer to use a six-strand technique when the tendon diameter is sufficient to allow this. The core suture should ideally have 10 mm, not 5 mm, proximal and distal to the repair. A pulver taft weave cannot be used in primary tendon repair in the digit, as it would entail significant tendon shortening and would create too much bulk to fit within the tendon sheath. Zone I Flexor Tendon Injuries A 20-year-old rugby player is seen one day after sustaining a closed injury while grabbing the shirt of an opponent during a game. He is unable to flex the dip joint of his right ring finger but is able to flex the pip joint. A radiograph confirms the presence of a bony fragment at the level of the pip joint. Which one of the following best describes this injury? Letty type 2. Zone I closed avulsion injuries of the FDP were classified by Letty and Packer in 1977 into three categories based on the presence of a bony fragment on radiograph, the blood supply, and the position of the retracted proximal tendon end. Additional fourth and fifth categories were subsequently added. The classification is useful to guide management. The patient described has a type 2 injury based on the bony fragment position and should undergo an open repair using a pull-out suture or bone anchor device. The modified Letty Packer classification includes the following, type I. The FDP tendon retracts into the palm with rupture of both vincula. Type 2, the FDP tendon avulses with a small fragment of distal phalanx, the long vinculum remains intact, and the tendon retracts to the level of the pip joint, A3 pulley. Type 3, a large bony fragment is avulsed with the tendon and is prevented from retraction beyond the middle phalanx by the A4 pulley. Type 4, an avulsion fracture of the distal phalanx combines with tendon avulsion from the fragment, along with tendon retraction. Type V, a bony avulsion of the FDP is coupled with a distal phalanx fracture, either intraarticular or extraarticular. Which one of the following is correct regarding zone I digital flexor tendon injuries? A bone anchor devices are useful for primary repair. Bone anchor devices may be used successfully in primary tendon repairs. The outcomes using bone anchors are comparable to pull-out suture techniques. The recommended technique is to insert either a mini mitec or two micro mitec anchors at a 45 degree angle from distal slash volar to proximal slash dorsal while taking care not to violate the dip joint surface or nail bed. When using a pull-out suture technique where the core suture is passed externally over the nail, a monofilament such as nylon or polypropylene is preferred. Braided sutures glide less well, are difficult to remove, and are also more prone to infection. 
FDP avulsion may also be repaired by drilling a small hole transversely through the distal phalanx for the core suture to pass through, enabling a fully internal repair. Although the normal recommendation for core suture repair is that there is 10 mm of tendon proximal and distal to the repair, a distal stump of 5 mm is considered sufficient for standard core suture repair of zone I flexor tendon injuries. For most flexor tendon injuries, repair within a week of injury is recommended. However, some injuries that involve avulsion of the tendon insertion from the distal phalanx, with minimal proximal retraction, due to either intact vinculi or a bony fragment anchored against a pulley, may still be repaired after several weeks. A delay repairing a retracted tendon can lead to a shortening, a quadrigia effect, and collapse of the flexor sheath. Different zones of flexor tendon injury require different principles of management. Which one of the following statements is correct? The oblique pulley is most important to preserve during FPL repairs. The most important pulley to preserve in the thumb, is the oblique pulley. Although the use of an epitendinous suture can add a further 15% to 20% strength to a flexor tendon repair, it is not necessary for zone V repairs. A 4 or 6 strand core repair is advocated for most injuries. Zone 2 injuries have the poorest functional outcomes. This zone was previously termed no man's land because of the difficulties with achieving satisfactory repair and outcomes. The carpal ligament should be repaired in zone 4 injuries to prevent bow stringing during rehabilitation. In most cases it is best to repair both FDS and FDP. However, many people do not have an FDS in the little finger and the FDS may not always be repaired in zone 2 if it is very small and likely to interfere with satisfactory movement of the FDP repair. Where there is a problem with bulk, some surgeons opt to repair only one slip of FDS and trim the other in zone 2. Clinical Scenarios A 23-year-old patient who is no longer able to flex the dip joint of his dominant ring finger five weeks after a game of rugby. A lateral radiograph is unremarkable. When discussing treatment options with him, which one of the following is correct? Consent should be obtained for both primary and staged repair. This is likely to be a Letty Packer type IFDP tendon avulsion injury, with the tendon end lying in the palm. The FDP tendon does not usually retract to the wrist because of the lumbrical attachments and the tendinous interconnections between the FDP tendons to the four fingers. In this scenario, the window for successful direct repair is reduced to 7 to 10 days compared to type 2 and 3 injuries because the tendon has lost both the vincular and synovial nutrient supplies, and the flexor sheath is largely empty and able to shrink down. There is a chance that this will actually be a type 2 injury, with an intact vinculum longum and the tendon end at the A3 pulley, in which case a direct repair might still be possible. 
However, this is much less likely, and beyond four weeks there may have been sufficient musculotendinous contraction to lead to an excessively tight repair, causing a troublesome quadriga effect. A quadriga effect occurs when shortening or tethering of one FDP tendon reduces power and excursion in the remaining three healthy tendons, as described by Verton. If a primary repair is not possible in a delayed presentation, it is not advisable to perform an immediate Palmaris graft because the sheath is usually scarred and contracted. Even if there is adequate space for a primary graft, the risk of adhesions is much higher than if a staged approach is used. A silicone, hunter, rod spacer is usually placed to generate a pseudo sheath for subsequent tendon grafting within eight weeks. Primary grafting with matriderm can be done. In which one of the following intraoperative scenarios should delayed primary tendon repair at a second operation be considered? Zone 1, index FDP division from a human bite wound the previous night. Immediate repair is not recommended in bite wounds because of contamination and an element of crush injury. A thorough debridement and washout in addition to antibiotic therapy is preferable, followed by a delayed primary tendon repair if the wound is clean at 48 to 72 hours. When exploring an open tendon injury, serous fluid in the sheath is not uncommon, however, turbid or frankly purulent fluid is a contraindication to immediate repair. For each of the following clinical scenarios, select the most likely diagnosis from the options listed. A 53-year-old man sustains a stab injury to the volar aspect of his palm in line with the ring finger. On examination he is able to flex the ring finger at both the pip and dip joints, but this is painful on resisted flexion. Partial Division of Zone 3 Flexor Tendon the patient in this scenario has sustained an injury in zone 3. There are two possible explanations for his pain on flexion. Either there is a partial flexion tendon injury or a hematoma from the injury causing discomfort. The safest management is to proceed with formal exploration to confirm the nature of the injury. Although many partial flexor tendon injuries do not require repair, exploration is warranted, because the tendon may subsequently rupture or cause triggering without repair. An 18-year-old girl falls onto glass while on a night out. She sustains a 1 cm laceration over the radial aspect of the wrist. Clinical examination reveals no significant deficit, except she is unable to flex the little finger pip joint independently. Absent flexor tendon the patient in this scenario is at risk of FCR and radial artery injury. Clinically these structures do not appear to be injured, although exploration may still be warranted, because glass injuries usually penetrate to the bone. The chances of her sustaining an isolated FDS little finger injury are slim given the site of injury. It is far more likely that she has a congenital absence of the FDS, 
This occurs in approximately 15% of the population. It is important to assess the contralateral limb, since the condition may well be bilateral. A 25-year-old patient is seen in clinic after physiotherapy following repair of a partial FPL zone 2 tendon division. Her thumb flexion is good, but she is unable to flex the thumb without the index finger dip joint flexing dash Lindbergh's anomaly. The patient in this scenario displays the Lindbergh anomaly, Lindbergh Comstock anomaly, in which there are attachments between the FPL and index FDP tendons in the carpal tunnel. This occurs in approximately a third of the population and will have been present before the tendon repair, but was not recognized and documented. Postoperative care When applying a splint after flexor tendon repair, which one of the following is correct? The IP joints should be almost fully extended. Precise postoperative care after flexor tendon repair is critical to achieving a good outcome. The patient must be placed in a dorsal blocking splint to prevent excessive extension of the repair. The wrist should be placed in slight flexion, as this weakens the flexor tendons and can reduce the risk of postoperative rupture. The dorsal blocking splint should usually maintain the MP joints in approximately 60 to 70 degrees of flexion. There is a wide range of preferred MP joint splint angles reported, 20 to 90 degrees, however, most authors agree that the IP joints should be able to straighten fully, otherwise flexion contract years will develop. Trying to force all four MP joints into 90 degrees of flexion often results in an MP joint angle of around 70 degrees and unintended flexion at the IP joints. Not all techniques require elastic band use in conjunction with the splint. The Kleinert protocol uses elastic band traction to facilitate active extension and passive flexion after repair. Other techniques rely on early, active mobilization and splinting alone. Which one of the following is correct regarding outcomes after flexor tendon repair? FPL is the most frequently ruptured flexor tendon after primary repair. The most commonly re-ruptured flexor tendon is the FPL, but ring, and little finger FDP tendons also have higher rates of re-rupture. The overall rate of re-rupture after primary repair is around 5% not 15 percent. Although re-rupture can be due to poor surgical technique during the repair, the main factors tend to be related to the postoperative care, such as patients removing the splint or not complying with rehabilitation advice. Contract years occur in around 20 percent of cases, and again this is affected by the rehabilitation and aftercare provided and patient compliance. Few patients require joint release, capsulotomy, for managing this complication. Tenolysis may be required in patients with adhesions that are unresponsive to focused hand therapy. These patients typically display an intact tendon repair with good passive ROM but poor active ROM.
Flexor tendon injuries. Arrangement of flexor. Digit orum profundus, FDP, and flexor. Digit orum superficialis, FDS, tendons. Within the flexor tendon sheath. Sheath. Fig 69 to 2 components of the flexor tendon sheath. A 1A5 are annular pulleys. C1C3R Cruciate pulleys Tip, mnemonic, proximal proximal and middle middle And transverse fibers of the palmar aponeurosis make up the PA pulley, also known as the A1 pulley Tip the A2 and A4 pulleys are the most important components for proper flexor tendon. Function Injury to these pulleys can lead to flexor tendon bowstringing. And the Fig 69 to 3 vincula of the flexor tendons. FDP, flexor digit orum profundus. FDS, flexor digit orum. Superficialis, VBP, vinculum brief profundus, VBS, vinculum brief superficialis, VLP, vinculum. Longum profundus, VLS, vinculum longum superficialis. Superficialis. Fig 69 to 4 flexor tendon zones of the digits. Flexor tendon zones, Verdon. A universal nomenclature for flexor tendon injuries has been established. Recommended techniques and prognosis vary by zone. And 5 zones for fingers 9. Fig 69 to 4. Zone I, distal to insertion of the FDS. Zone 2, from A1 pulley to FDS insertion, within the sheath. No man's land. Zone 3, from distal end of the carpal tunnel to A1 pulley. Zone 4, within the carpal tunnel. Zone V, proximal to the carpal tunnel. And five zones for thumb. Zone TI, distal to interphalangeal, IP, joint. Zone T2, from A1 pulley to IP joint. Zone T3, over thenar eminence. Zone T4, within the carpal tunnel. Zone TV, proximal to the carpal tunnel. Tip, sensation should be evaluated with static. Moving two-point discrimination tests. Before using local anesthetic. Tip, emergency flexor tendon repair is not required unless the digit is devascularized. Primary repair, less than 24 hours. Preferred option when feasible. Contraindications. Gross contamination or human bites. Evidence of active infection, cellulitis. Purulence. Lack of stable soft tissue coverage. Delayed primary repair.
more than 24 hours but less than 2 weeks. Reasonable option for heavily contaminated wounds. Functional results comparable to primary repair. Secondary repair. Early, 2 to 5 weeks. Performed before significant muscle contraction. Functional results similar to delayed primary repair. Increased risk of infection and prolonged edema with longer repair delay. Late, more than 5 weeks. Presence of tendon edema and softening. Flexor tendon sheath becomes scarred reducing likelihood of good tendon gliding within the tendon sheath repair without advancement and extension deficit prohibited by significant muscular contraction best treatments tendon graft or tendon transfer tip the fdp tendon may be advanced up to but not more than 1 cm excessive advancement. Creates a quadriga effect in which a flexion deformity appears in the repaired digit, and the adjacent digits have limited active flexion. Tendon grafting. Segmental tendon loss or muscular contracture necessitates grafting for repair. Single stage. Requires adequate tendon sheath and pulleys, soft tissue coverage, and supple joints. Common donors. Palmaris longus, 13 cm. Plantaris, 31 cm. Extrinsic third or fourth toe extensor, 30 cm. Two-stage used when tendon sheath is scarred or unusable. First stage. Native tendon is excised. Pulleys are reconstructed as necessary. A silicone rod, hunter rod, is sutured to distal FDP tendon stump. Rod induces formation of a pseudo sheath with repetitive passive motion of the digit within approximately eight weeks. Second stage. Tendon graft is sutured to the distal end of silicone rod and pulled through pseudo sheath. The proximal juncture to the native FDP, or FDS, tendon is made with a pulver taft weave. The distal juncture is made with a pull-out suture or suture anchor to distal phalanx bone. Tension is adjusted so that the cascade of fingers is slightly tighter in the grafted digit. If the tendon graft is placed too loosely or if it is too long, it can result in a lumbrical plus deformity. Fig 69 to 5 Surgical Exposure of the Flexor Tendon Sheath Modified Kessler Technique Indiana Technique Six Strand Technique Fig 69 to 6 Popular Core Suture Techniques For End-to-End -end Tendon Repair Tip a monofilament pull-out suture is easier to tip. A monofilament pull-out suture is easier to remove and less susceptible to infection than braided suture material. Key, Key points: the best results are associated with early repair. Flexor tendon repair should be performed in the operating room, with a tourniquet and loop magnification. The FDP tendon should not be advanced more than 1 cm. 
proper splint placement and postoperative rehabilitation are as important as operative technique. Complications Ruptures occur in 5% of all repairs, slightly more common for FPL than for other finger tendons. Immediate exploration and re-repair recommended. Recurrent rupture best treated with secondary tendon reconstruction, tendon transfer, or arthrotesis. Adhesions. Limited range of motion and function caused by postoperative and post-injury scars between tendon and surrounding structures. Increased likelihood of adhesions with prolonged immobilization and severe injury. Consider tenolysis if more than three to six months have elapsed since the tendon repair. Tendon repair is intact, but there is a large discrepancy between total active range of motion ROM, and total passive ROM. Soft tissue is supple with normal or near-normal passive ROM. There is no appreciable improvement in active ROM after four to six weeks of aggressive hand therapy. Contract years Affect 17% of flexor tendon repairs 26. Prevention and treatment primarily with splinting. Open or closed capsulotomy reserved for severe and recalcitrant cases.